Hi, everyone. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. So I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to turn my video off now just so we can have the bandwidth focused on the demo. So you guys, Carla and Marielle, are welcome to do either. OK. Um, <clears throat> OK, so as Erica said, this is the first of a series of webinars that we plan to do um, to introduce people to Arcto. So this one that we're going to do today is a very basic overview of Arctos, what it is, and some of those sort of major features. And I've just put up here a page from our website that shows some the, the next two that we've scheduled and then other ones that we plan to schedule. Um, so if people are interested in future ones, this is the way to go. Um, you can This is on our website here, um, arctosdb.org. Um, so um, <clears throat> just a little bit about Arctos. Um, so we like to think of Arctos as a a collaborative, community-driven collection information management system. Here's the website again. Um, and, and we think of it as sort of two parts. One is Arctos is a data platform. So Arctos is a rich data platform that currently serves data from over 3.2 um, million records. And that includes both specimens and observational data. Um, and from 124 collections and 25 institutions. All of those are in one shared instance. Um, the data are hosted at the Texas Advanced Computing Center, um, which is part of um, the University of Texas at Austin. And then a separate instance of Arctos is run by Harvard under the name MCZ Base. Um, so some of the sort of key features about Arctos itself, um, the data structure are highly normalized. So um, this means that it, uh, redundancy and error are minimized. So it's a highly relational database with where we try to minimize redundancy and error through a highly normalized data structure. Um, because it is shared by multiple institutions, it's, a, it's set up as a virtual private database. So each collection is its own collection in Arctos. Um, and the collection staff can restrict who has access to that collection. They can encumber data for their collection. But then um, all of the collections in Arctos together um, share certain data uh, types and fields. So um, they're controlled and standardized vocabularies for things like agents and geography, taxonomy, georeferencing. All of those are shared across collections. So that makes it really useful if, for example, a new collection comes in, they can take a, a advantage of existing um, georeferencing that's already been done for other collections um, for localities, for the same localities. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and then the data are all searchable through um, the Arctos data portal as well as through a number of different data aggreg aggregators. Um, but in addition to Arctos, the data platform, Arctos is a community because it is a shared database. It's a large community and a growing community of users. And this is important because the Arctos community is act, very active in guiding development of Arctos, um, developing the data vocabulary and data standards, and curating the data and improving the quality of shared data. And so what that means is that it, it results in, a, in a, basically a, a well-curated, high-quality data database. Um, and um, the Arctos community it's also really important in terms of governance. So we can talk a little bit more about this, but there's an Arctos steering committee. There's an Arctos working group. The working group is active in um, contributing to the documentation, um, uh, funding support. Um, so uh, people that write grants, collections that write grants that include funding for Arctos, usually it's for a specific thing, but it benefits the Arctos community as a whole through the development of new features. Um, Arctos is constantly changing. It's very dynamic. It's not static. Um, and every time um, a collection has an issue or needs guidance, it basically improves the documentation and the system. And, and I should also add, in terms of the community, one thing that we just started fairly recently is a mentorship kind of thing. I mean, there is definitely you know a learning curve with Arctos, and so we're trying to. Um, mentor new collections that come in through sort of a, a, a closer relationship to help these new collections learn learn Arctos. 
Um, and hopefully these webinars will also um, provide, you know, good training tools for, for learning artists. Um, so, um, and Mario, you can, uh, let me just show the three main sites and then see if you need, want to add anything. So as Erica said, there's, there's kind of, I just want to show some, a few of the sort of main sites. So this is the Arctos webpage, so you can learn about Arctos, learn about joining, um, learning resources, um, those, the um, uh, data licensing and use, um, things like that, and then sort of what's new in Arctos and new collection trends. We all are also on Twitter, um, so you can follow us on Twitter. Um, the data portal is arctos.database.museum, which we'll do a live demo in a few minutes. Um, so this is the data portal. Um, and this is something that we just developed fairly recently. This is the Arctos handbook. And we're developing, in addition to documentation about sort of the data structure, um, we're developing a lot of how-to guides, which are being developed by um, Arctos users. So basically, how to cite specimens, how to create agents, how to create citations, how to start a new collection. These are all done in GitHub, um, so it's a fairly um, there's there's documentation on how to do this, but basically the community is contributing to the documentation, and so that's helping both new collections coming in, learn Arctos, and also existing collections do um, do things that they're. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we kind of strive for high quality data. So on our website, we've got some examples which people may want to look at um, of sort of different kinds of Arctos records and what they show and why we think that these are sort of high quality gold standard records. Um, and then finally, um, here's the Arctos GitHub site. So all of the code is on GitHub um, right here. All of the how-to guides are on GitHub. And then we also manage all of the issues on GitHub. So these are all the active issues um, that are open right now, 211 issues. So anybody that has an issue, whether it's a, a bug, something that's not working, or they want a new feature, or, or you know, whatever it is, it can, can post an issue. Some of these issues require, um, are pretty simple fixes. Others require community discussion because they have implications for all Arctos users. And so these are the sorts of things that the Arctos Working Group um, discusses during our, our meetings and tries to sort of provide guidance. There is also an Arctos Google group, so anybody who's in Arctos can also join the Arctos Google group, and some of these things that require broader discussion are disseminated more broadly to the entire Arctos group. Uh, group. And then finally, the all of the data, as I mentioned, Arctos is published um, on a number of different data aggregators. Um, the the data are hosted the, as Darwin Core Archives on the integrated publishing toolkit that is um, run through by Vertnet. And so this is just a, a you, can, uh, you can see it here, ipt.vertnet.org. And if you actually filter by Arctos, um, um, you'll see all of the Arctos collections there. Um, and metadata about those collections. And so these are all the Darwin Core archives that are then harvested by um, GBIF and by iDigBio um, and other, other data aggregators. Um, so that's kind of the basic overview. Before we get into the live demo, Mariel, do you want to add anything? No, that sounds pretty good, Carla. Anybody have any questions? Um, I'll be responding to questions through the comment line. So if anybody wants to, to interject something as a comment during this, then please feel free, and we'll address your questions. OK, so, um, so right, and we're going to try to do this, I think, and uh, finish in maybe another half hour or so, so we can then open it up for questions as well. Um, okay, so going back to sort of the main data portal. So as I said, this is the main data portal. You can see 3.2 million records. Um, the first thing is that you can search. You can basically search anything you want. You don't need to be logged in to do that, um, but you do need to be logged in to download records. And so here's the login um, um, 
So you can log in here, um, and then you can also create an account here. And if you're just doing so that to download records, you just create an account. It's kind of a public guest account, and you can do what you need to do. Um, but if you want to, if you're an actual Arctos operator, somebody that's going to be starting to actually manage data in Arctos, you would create an account, create an account, and then whoever is the manager of the collection or the administrator, you know, curator, whatever of the collection would then give you the proper permissions to be able to actually do something in that collection. Um, and the controls are um, the controls are not only at the collection side, but also at the at the table level. So um, for example, we have students, we have a lot of students working here at the MVZ, so we give them permission to do things like data entry um, and <clears throat> scan barcodes and things like that, but we don't give them permission to edit taxonomy or edit agents. So there's very fine level control over who can do what. Um, so um, let's see. Um, so as I said, Arctos um, has both um, specimens and observations. Um, all of the collections that are in Arctos are shown here as drop downs. Um, and so you'll see the institution at the top of each section, and then the actual collections that are there. Um, if you go down to like Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. You'll see there's bird observations and then there's bird specimens. Okay, so if you want to search both of those, like all bird data, you would have to click all three of these. So it kind of depends on what you're what you're looking for. Um, and right now, there's more about um, I think there's something like 37,000 observational records. So a lot of those are actually um, vouchered, but they're not vouchered by specimens. They're vouchered by audio recordings or photographs. So they're media vouchered specimens. Um, Okay, so um, so you can search this. Let's start here. You can search for specimens. You can search for, and I'll get into this a little bit more later, but um, you can search for projects and publications. So projects and publications is a way the, of tracking usage of data by researchers. So for example, um, when a loan request comes in, we create a project for it. Um, and then the loan is attached to the project, and any publications that come out of that loan can also be attached to the project, and so you can easily track usage of, of your collections that way. Um, you can also search taxonomy, um, and we're gonna, we'll have a whole another webinar on taxonomy, but basically you can search um, taxonomy, which has different hierarchical classifications, and you can add, um, you know, if you're logged in as an operator, you can obviously manage taxonomy. You can search media and documents. So this includes um, photographs, audio recordings, video recordings, um, things like uh, like ledgers or other multi-page documents. Um, um, geography. So basically, this is and this is without being logged in. Um, so all of the higher geography, the code tables. This is useful um, for people that um, are trying to sort of uh, get their data into Arctos format or. or um, students that need to know the name of a particular part, like how it is in Arctos, but don't have access to the code tables. This is sort of a public view. And then agents as well. Um, the, OK, so over here, the portals link, that will take you to the, um, to, it's a little bit slow because well, there's a lot of data, but that'll take you to the, all, basically, all of, again, all of the holdings. Um, in Arctos, waiting for it to load. Um, here we go. Um, so here are all of the collections, um, and then descriptions about those collections, um, the number of specimens, you know, with a direct search to just those collections, uh, just that collection. Um, whether there's if there's a loan policy, there should be a link to a loan policy somewhere down here. <laughs> um, let me see. Yeah, so here's our collection loan policy, our collection homepage. So some basic metadata, and these, this, the metadata that are here are like the descriptions are used to populate the the VertNet IPT um, data. Um, okay, so um, let me go back. Um, okay, so um, so a little bit more about the sort of basic search. Um, so you can either, this is sort of the way it comes up, but you can either, you can show more, for any one of these blocks, you can show more options or fewer options. So here under date collector, for example, there's a lot of information about date that you can search on. 
Same thing for taxonomy. Same thing for look geography. Um, you can also actually do a search on a Google map if you want. Um, you can, um, and then there's some of these that are sort of more, here's another way of searching media as well. Um, so you can search media either through the media search portal or through the specimen search portal. So anything, the main difference is that media search through the specimen search portal are, are attached to either specimen or so to some kind of cataloged item, whether it's a specimen or an observation. Whereas here through the, the media search portal, we also have a lot of media that are attached to just things like collecting events or people, a picture that shows a photograph of a person in the field. And so you may not necessarily, you're not necessarily going to find it here, but you will find it here. Um, if you want um, tissues, click that box. So, um, so uh, parts are coded as being a tissue or not a tissue. This is one of the things that we're in the process of discussing is what actually it, uh, defines a tissue. But anyway, if you if you click require tissues, you'll get records that just have tissue samples associated with them. Um, um, if you do show more options. Um, so here are the under, uh, other identifier types. Um, you can, so you can search by accession, you can search by um, collector number if you want. Um, so I have collector number as my sort of default identifier because I do a lot of searching by collector number. So you can set that as a default. And then here you can also search by things like gem bank um, records. And um, I'll give you an example here of, so we have a lot of records that are linked to gem bank. So here's one example of a mammal from the Museum of Southwestern Biology. You can see all of the five different gem bank linkouts. Um, and if you click on this, um, it'll get you to this, which I've just brought up here, which is the, the gem bank record. And then here is a link out back to that um, mammal record. And um, we can, we'll talk more about that later, but it's important that when people are adding data to GemBank, they're doing it in this three-part format, which is the institution code with a colon, the collection code with a colon, and then the catalog number. If the data are entered in that format, then they'll, the linkouts will be automatic back to Arctos. They still need to be added to Arctos, but from GemBank, they'll link automatically back to the Arctos specimen record. Um, Let's see. Um, OK, so let me just do, there's, um, so I, I want to just talk a little bit about customizing your, so I've talked about sort of customizing your search. Um, and um, let me just talk about, let me just show customizing your results. So I'm just going to sort of, did I hear something? Um, Um, okay, so here's the search results. I just searched MVZ bird 1 to 10. Um, and again, I'm not logged in. Um, if I were logged in because I've, I've customized how I want my results to, the data that I want my results to include, every time I, I do a search result, it includes all of the data, but I'm not logged in. So it's just going to give me some basic data. Um, but there's some tools here to... Um, so you can map the results in Berkeley Mapper. So Berkeley Mapper is, is um, a mapping program that was developed here uh, by the Berkeley Natural History Museums. And um, so anything that's georeferenced, you can map in Berkeley Mapper, and you can look at it in, in different ways. Um, um, you can um, also map the results in Google Maps or download it for Google Earth. Here's where you can customize your form so you can add or remove data fields. So if you always want accession to show or if you always want collectors to show, you just click the ones that you want and then save and refresh and it'll save those. Um, you can also remove checked rows. So say you, <clears throat> you do a query and you're like, well, I don't want this one and this one in the loan or whatever, you can remove those. And then, um, and then there's a bunch more tools. So let me actually go ahead and log in because um, okay, let's 
go back to my specimen search. So you'll see now that I'm logged in, I have a lot more tabs up here, which let me actually do things. Um, so things like um, like data entry, uh, bulk loading, um, manage, so chain, manage location agents, um, uh, containers, things like barcodes, loans, accessions, things like that, metadata, like code tables. Um, and so if I um, go back to MVZ, bird specimens, uh, do that same query. So here's the map again, um, and then you get this other button, this other drop down where you can manage stuff here. So basically, I want to change all of the, change the accession number for all of these records to something else, or modify their parts, or encumber them, or change their IDs, or whatever. So there's a bunch of batch tools that here where you can make batch changes, as well as here where there's batch tools for, um, mostly for bulk loading data. Um, so, um, um, okay, so let's see what else. Um, okay, yeah, so um, another thing I wanted to talk about is relationships. So one of the nice things about Arctos is that it's really easy to relate specimens to other records. The only thing that you need is a URL, and they can be other records in your collection. They can be other records in different collections within Arctos, or they can be other records um, outside of Arctos, as long as it has a URL. So, so we have records that are, li are linked as externally, as I mentioned, to GemBank, but also to things like Digimorph, um, MorphoBank, um, things like that, and then and then within and then within and across collections and institutions in Arctos. So, so for example, things like if you have um, a predator prey type situation where you have a snake um, and a mouse, you can catalog both of those and, and easily relate them to each other, or host parasites. So I was going to give a couple of examples of the host parasite um, relationships. So here's an example of a bird, an MVZ bird. So again, it's got that three part. This is a horn lark. Um, and <clears throat> you can see that. Um, over here under relationships, so here's all of the basic information about that bird. Under relationships, you can see that it's the host of a parasite that was cataloged in the Museum of Southwestern Biology. And the MSB folks also cataloged this individual as a host in their collection. So they have a host catalog. So it's the same individual as MSB host 6746. Um, but it's a host of MSB Parasite 1992. And so here's the um, link out to that um, parasite at MSB. And again, there you can see that it's the parasite of MSB host 6746 and also MVZ bird 13462. So if you click on that, it'll link you back to this record. You can also see here that it's been tagged in media. So um, Mariel, as part of their Roush project, went through, they scanned the, um, the Roush parasite, um, host parasite ledger. And so this is um, considered a multi-page document. Here's the horned lark that's been tagged. And you can see that it, the tag is linked to MVZ bird 134762. So, so a lot of nice relationships between media and different kinds of collections. Did I hear something? I'd like to make a quick comment, Carla, too, and about the linkages between the different relationships. In that, in this case, of course, a host and a parasite collected at were collected at the same place at the same time, and so by default, they should be sharing collecting events. And this linkage allows us to do that. We can share collecting events. We can update collecting events simultaneously. We can create the relationships, even even across collections and across institutions. Yep. Yeah, no, that's that's good. Um, does, should we take a break? Does anybody, are there any hands up? There was a question, Carla, about um, the IDIC bio and GBIF, uh, whether they pull data directly from the Darwin Core archives or whether there's an additional step to push those data. 
Um, they yeah, they do get data directly from the Darwin Court archives. Um, and um, the meta, yeah, I, I, well, they get data directly through the IPT. So the IPT has you know the metadata about the collection and um, and then the Darwin Core Archives actually have the data records. And so all of the data are coming from the, the IPT. Both of, There's two parts to, to publishing those data in the data aggregators. One is the metadata and one is the actual data records. But there, and both of those are coming from the, the Vernet IPT. Does that answer? Yeah. OK. So let me go back to where I was. Um, OK, so I mentioned projects and publications. So you know, as collection curators and collection managers, one of the things that obviously you know, we want to do is track usage of our collections. This is important for administrators. It's important for grant funding. And so as I mentioned, we do that through projects and publications. Um, and so a project is basically you know, any uh, I mean, anybody working on a research project can submit a project description. Um, and um, any transaction can be attached to a project. So an accession is a transaction that can be attached to a project. A loan is a transaction that can be attached to a project. And then the publications, again, we attach to the project. And then we have a number of different tools for adding citations to those publications. So. Um, and that, that can be done either through an interface or we have batch tools for doing that as well, um, bulk load citations. So one, one project that um, I don't know if people saw a re fairly recent paper in science on the evolution of egg shape in birds. So this is actually a project that I created sort of after the fact. But um, so there's the principal investigator, with the, which is um, Mary Caswell Stoddard. And here's the title. Um, and then the project description. So every project has to have a description. And then um, this project produced one publication. And, you can, and here's a link out to the science article. So we try to include DOIs for every publication if we if we can. Um, so that's cool. So you can link directly out to the to the um, publication. And this because she um, this was based on on. All, it was entirely based on media, on images of eggs in our collection. Um, so I asked her after after this paper came out for a list of all of the specimens that she used, which she sent to me, and I uploaded those and cited them. So every single egg specimen now that was used in this paper is cited as being used in that paper. And so you can see it here through, I'm not going to click on that because it's over 13,000 specimens. but. Um, you can see it here as part of the publication and also here under specimens used. And I didn't um, link all the media, the, all the 13,000 images, but I did actually create new media for all of the, um, all of the, 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 uh, the PR that came out of this, because was, there was a lot of PR, National Public Radio, New York Times, Science News, LA Times, Science News, so you can you know, media can be anything. It can be a web page. It can be a photograph. It can be an image. Um, so here is um, basically um, uh, National Public Radio. And there should be a link. Um, let's see if there's a link to it. Um, no. OK, well, that didn't work. OK, I'll have to figure that out. But um, anyway, so that's kind of cool. Um, another, kinda, another good example. Um, is uh, let's see, this one, that's this one. Um, um, hold on one second. Um, lost my, all right, I'll go back over to here. Um, is the Beringian Coevolution Project, and let me just get that one. Um, so this is a project out of um, led by Joe Cook. Um, at MSB, kind of same thing. So multiple investigators. You can have a sponsored. So this has National Science Foundation um, with the award number, um, the description. Um, in this case, this one produced 22 publications. So all of these publications are linked together by this one project. 
Um, and again, with link outs to those publications and information on the cited specimens. And then down here, uh, you can see that that project has used over about 1,200 specimens, but both from MSB and UAM. So one of the nice things about having this shared collaborative system is that researchers are oftentimes requesting material from multiple institutions, and so those can be linked together through this, through pro projects and publications in this way. So here are specimens from MSB, both mammals, parasites, and um, University of Alaska. So three different collections have contributed to this project at two different institutions. Um, and a number of different projects have actually contributed specimens to this project. Um, and a number of project, other projects have used specimens contributed by the project. <laughs> And then here's media, um, so these are uh, images of parasites that are linked to the project. So it's a great way of, of sort of tying, tying things together to show um, research usage. Um, OK, so then let's see, I wanted to touch on um, media. So as I mentioned, there's two ways of searching media. So there's the media portal which um, will get you basically all types of media, regardless of whether they're associated with a cataloged item or not. So things like habitat images um, and um, um, uh, images of people, as I mentioned. Um, so you can search by relationship. You can search by labels. You can search by dates. You can search by relationships. So media are, real, and we're going to have a webinar just on media, but media, um, can have labels, any number of labels, which are just text fields, but they can also have relationships that are related to specific tables in the database. So it's all controlled, um, standardized. So if you're just interested in images associated with a particular project or images that were created by Joseph Grinnell or images that show Joseph Grinnell, um, show Joseph Grinnell, you can search those here. Um, and then if you want to um, and then the other way, as I mentioned, is through the, the search portal. So if you go down here to, to media, um, um, show more options. Um, so you can search here by um, any, type of, any type of media, but it's only going to give you ones that are associated with a cataloged item. So for example, we just, record, we just digitized all of our audio recordings in the MVZ, or a few years ago we did this. And, a lot of those are linked to specimens. A lot of them are linked to, um, to um, they, the specimen was not collected, the voucher was not collected. But if you're interested in audio recordings, any recordings we have of, of spotted toeys or any species, you, you would search for those here. Um, and Erica is going to be, hopefully, um, adding a bunch of film to Arctos at some point through a, a uh, a grant to digitize these films, and so there's a lot of flexibility here in the types of, of media that we can add. Um, I just wanted to give one example of, of, of media, because this is kind of a neat one. So this is an egg specimen. So here's a specimen. Um, again, it's that three parts, so institution, collection code, and, um, and this catalog number. This is a sandhill crane. Here's all the data about the specimen. So as part of that audio digitization grant, we took digital images of all of our eggs. Um, these, are, these were used um, in that project that I mentioned. We also scanned all of the um, egg, original egg data slips. So this has information um, about nesting and things like that. This one doesn't have as much as a lot of the other ones. Um, but what's neat is that we also have images. And actually, if you go here, you can see photos of this nest and set of eggs um, is filed in the MVZ photo file. So I went to the MVZ archives, and there are two photographs in the MVZ archives. Um, so these are historical photographs. This is one of the eggs um, in, the, um, in the nest in the field. Um, and here's the archival um, record. So you can see our data slip for this. This, this was collected or taken in 1931. Um, and then a picture of the actual habitat where the um, where the the nest was 
And so, again, a neat way of sort of interlinking these um, and showing this historical data with modern data um, and, and these, these interlinkages. Um, so, um, and these two images you would not find if you were searching on the specimen search. You'd only find them if you were searching in the media search portal because they're, they're linked. Well, this one is linked to the collecting event. Um, so, Mariel, do you want to say anything about any more about images? Um, it's just a really good way to be able to um, put up field notes, uh, link records to field notes, document accessions, and document uh, collecting events. And also, of course, our media, because it is stored at the Texas Advanced Com Computing Center, we have quite a bit of, of storage space. And this is all be part of um, so the, the Arctos uh, environment. You'd be able to have media storage as well. Right. So, yeah, I should say something about that, right? So all of the data are stored at, at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. And um, so that includes the data and the media. And right now, basically, you know, we're not being charged for any storage of media. Um, that may change, but even if it does change, um, the, the, the cost is going to be minimal, like maybe $100 per terabyte. Most collections right now have less than a terabyte, but there's but uh, we um, MVZ and UAM have over five terabytes, and we're not paying for any of that storage. We store we have all of our field notes scanned there. We have all of our audio recordings stored there. High res both the initial high res high resolution files and the process sort of web accessible files. Um, so yeah, that's a great partnership. Um, okay, and then um, just a few more minutes. So let's see, data entry and bulk lending. I wanted to say something about that. Um, so here, um, under data entry and bulk loading, so we have a data entry um, interface. It's a stop. Um, uh, let's see, wait, load. Okay, so. And enter your last MVZ bird, or because I, you're, most people aren't going to see all of these collections. I see pretty much everybody's collection, but anyway. Um, so enter a new record, and then um, it's your standard data entry form. But it's it is customizable, so you can. Um, it's customizable both in terms of the collection type. So um, for things like, for example, attributes, um, you only see attributes that are relevant to the type of collection type of data, like bird attributes. Um, versus herp attributes, things like that. But it's also somewhat semi-customizable in terms of um, data that carry over and things like that. Um, and then there's also um, a customizable bulk loader template. So a lot of the data entry is done through bulk loading, which is basically a, a fancy spreadsheet that has <clears throat> specific columns. Um, that need to be formatted in a specific way. And so you can customize your bulk loader because some accessions, some data are more complicated than others. There are certain fields that are required. Um, those are all of the ones that are checked. Um, and but basically this is a new, you know, this is you can add as many fields as you want. And um, and the thing with bulk loading versus versus data entry, again, we'll have a, a webinar on this, but with the data entry form, you select the agents from the agent table. You select the, the taxonomy from the taxonomy table, whereas here, you're typing it in. So you need to make sure that the names that you put in there for people and, and taxonomy and things like that um, match what's in the Arctos authorities. And so there's more sort of troubleshooting and error um, checking with bulk loading. But when you're doing a lot of records, it's obviously a, a much faster way to do it. Um, we also have a lot of tools for um, checking data before bulk loading. Um, so things like checking agents and taxa parts to make sure that the names actually exist. So it does a check between what's in your spreadsheet and what's in the authority, and then helps you to resolve those discrepancies. So we use a lot of that for, um, for people that are, are migrating new data into Arctis. Um, and I'll, I, I should say one, just one quick thing about migrating data. So um, for new collections that are interested in coming into Arctis, there's a number of different ways to do it. One is through, if you're just starting from scratch, you can do it directly into Arctis, either through the data entry form or through bulk loading. And, you know, we're here to help people do that. 
and help um, use these bulk these pre bulk loaders to check their data and help sort of clean up their data. And then more recently, within the last like year and a half, we've been working with the VertNet folks to run data through their um, data cleaning migrator data migrators, which help to clean data and map it to Darwin Core field before it before Arctos even sees it. So there's sort of different pathways depending on um, the situation. Um, okay, and then go here to manage data. Um, so manage data is you can, as I mentioned, you can manage location. So um, geography, uh, collecting events, things like that. Agents, so that's people and organizations. One nice thing about this is you can also um, look at agent activity, um, which um, let's see. So um, so here's um, my record, and then um, uh, um, so you can see all of the things that I've done, um, number of specimens. These dates, some of these old dates, is because we don't know what the actual date is of the specimen. But anyway, I've contributed all of these specimens. And if you actually click on, and I'm not going to do it, but if you click on the view agent activity report, you'll see what that person has done in terms of collecting specimens, preparing specimens, um, uh, loans, um, accessions, media, all sorts of different publications, all sorts of different things. So um, we actually just we actually use the agent activity to, to see what our undergraduates have done in the MVZ and in terms of contributing to the, the museum's um, output of specimens cataloged and things like that. So it's a great way to do that. And then transactions, so accessions, um, loans and permits, so we do actually track, you can add permits in here. Um, these are shared, so we don't really, I mean, you can create a media record for a permit and link it, but then everybody else is going to see the permit, so, um, so um, because media are shared, um, but, but transactions are not, so, you know, MBZ transactions aren't seen by Museum of Southwestern Biology, for example. Another nice thing is that Arctos sends a lot of email reminders. So if you have an overdue loan and you're entered as a loan contact, it'll send you a reminder. If you have a permit that's expiring and, and, you, and you're entered as a permit contact, it'll remind you about that. Um, so that's kind of nice. So there's a lot of sort of automated things like that. Um, so object tracking, I wanted to say something about object tracking. So object tracking is basically used for barcoding. And um, so you can search by barcode. You can scan the barcode in, or you can search by labels. And I'm just going to do a real quick um, uh, search here. This is a, a box of uncatalogued tissues that I have from Paraguay. Um, and um, just to kind of show you, um, so you can search by label. So because they're uncatalogued, we've Kind of, um, we still want to scan them and be able to track them. So here are all the tissues, tissue boxes. We're in the process of cataloging them right now. If you click on that, um, you'll see um, the position. So this says all of the um, the tissues with the field number and the barcode in that box. Um, and you can see that this freezer box is in um, slot nine of rack um, 53, um, section F of freezer one. So it's kind of this hierarchical thing. And then if they were cataloged, you would see all of the um, specimens that were associated with those tissues. Um, I mentioned agents. So yeah, another thing about agents is you can add a lot of, of data about, a uh, metadata about agents. So things like relationships. This person was a student of, of, so, of this other person. Um, or um, a spouse. Um, or this is an old name because this is, they're now under this married name, things like that. Addresses, obviously. Um, and then finally, um, go back here. Um, um, things, metadata. So code tables, which is basically our controlled things. But there's also, um, you can encumber data. So if you don't want data available for whatever reason, you can mask the collector. You can mask the entire record. Um, you can um, mask the year collected, um, you know, mask the coordinates. Those are probably the most common thing that people don't want to make available. And then um, 
and then it'll become available once the encumbrance. Um, and, um, and then finally, because I'm almost done, finally um, reporting. So there's a lot of different reports. We kind of have to work on cleaning this up, but you can get a lot of information about statistics on, on usage um, of the collection, so, um, or usage of Arctos, usage of, of data from Arctos by collection. Um, so system to statistics, so um, I just created a graph that showed the growth of Arctos by year, so I did that under system statistics. Um, the reporter is, is what we use. This is all done in Cold Fusion front end and Oracle back end, and so Cold Fusion has a reporter called um, that allows you to, to uh, build reports, basically, for labels like, um, um, you know, box labels, skeleton box labels, things like that. Um, there's also some other miscellaneous things like GenBank MIA. So these are, so it goes out and it searches GenBank for um, records that it thinks should be part of Arctos but aren't actually in Arctos. And so, um, again, by collection. And so you can look at that and say, oh, you know, there's 100 GenBank records that, are that and then you that should be in MVZ birds and then you can go through those and add them um, if if you want so so I think that's I mean, that's pretty good timing wise so I think that's kind of everything I wanted to sort of the brief overview point out um, and um, if people have uh, and that, so Erica and Mario I don't know if you want to add to anything or should we just open it up or what do you want to do should just take questions, or um, anybody has anything they would like to see more of? Carla, um, this is Erica. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, so say someone is interested in joining Arctos, um, what does it, what does Arctos require in terms of like technical infrastructure at your institution? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, in terms of technical infrastructure, um, nothing other than really a computer. I mean, everything, so one thing about Arctos is that uh, it's all online. So when you enter your data into Arctos, um, whether it's through data entry or through bulk loading or whatever, it's online. So it's all, it's, the entire system is web-based. So basically you just need a computer where you can create spreadsheets and um, have a, an internet connection with a browser. So technically there's not much that's required. Um, when if people want to join Arctos, the first thing that we have them do is fill out an initial questionnaire um, with some questions, basic questions about their collection and their data, to, just to give us a general idea. Um, and then we'll start to communicate with with the collection and um, about um, things like um, so you know what the best way to migrate the data in. Um, so again, it kind of depends on the situation, um, both in terms of the size of the collection, and but probably more sort of the complexity and how much data cleaning is required. And I think really importantly, what kind of expertise or staff are available at that institution um, to help with data cleaning. Um, uh, because, you know, there's only so much that we can do or that BertNet can do, but the collections itself need to have somebody there who can who can help with, with some of that data cleaning before it comes in because, you know, everything that comes in needs to match. There are, there are um, you know, all authorities and code tables of data need to match that for things like hydrography and people and parts. And then there's other kinds of data like remarks, which are more free form, and sometimes we'll just you know, get the data in as best as we can, and then, you know, it'll be up to the collection to sort of clean it up, uh, work on cleaning it up afterwards. Um, so, and so talk about that, talk about um, costs or information, you know, that's usually one of the main things that people want to know about. Um, and so, um, so here's um, a link to cost of joining, um, which is, you know, we do, because Arctos is community supported, there is an annual contribution um, based on collection size, um, but, you know, that is negotiable, so, you know, our goal is to try to help collections get their data online and, um, you know, work with you the best we can to do that. Um, and then, um, uh, let's see what else, um, and then, you know, hopefully, depending on who you are and the kind of the expertise, um, we'll try to set you up with some kind of, you know, mentor 
um, to help you help you uh, get the data in. Does that answer the question? But technically, there's really no obstacle to getting your data in. It's more, I think it's more a matter of people um, and, and having somebody at the local inst at the local collection who can help and who knows something about the data and can help um, get their data migrated. Yeah, I think that was a, a great overview. Um, Carrie had a question about printing labels, which I think Marielle answered in the chat. And then Cindy is wondering if Arctos uses standard authorities or does each institution choose its own authorities? So either Marielle or Carla, if you want to address that. Well, um, Carla, you go ahead. I... Yeah, so um, so there, there, Arctos uses, so all of the Arctos collections share authorities. So basically there's one authority for agents. Um, so um, let's see if I can log in. Um, yeah, so there's one, so basically there's one table for agents and, um, you know, it's a, there's a lot of obviously duplicate agents in there because so many collections have come in. So there are tools for cleaning those up. Right now, this author, this agent authority doesn't, um, it's not based on anything standardized like the Library of Congress names authority or things like that. I mean, those are things that we've talked about. Um, but the, the, the authority table was basically built by the data that have come into Arctos um, and, and then been, you know, we've tried to clean it up as much as possible. Same thing for geography. So we're constantly trying to, um, I mean, we do look at other outside authorities, but it's basically the Arctos authority for, ge for higher geography. And so, um, you know, if, uh, for example, I was just doing something with Ireland and the way that we had Ireland in the, in the system just didn't make sense compared to the current, you know, what the current place, the current um, administrative divisions. And so we made some changes there. And again, that was sort of a community discussion before we did that. So everybody in Arctos shares one authority shares the same authority, but it's not necessarily an authority, the same authority that's shared by, say, GBIF or by, um, uh, you know, other outside. Does that, does that, I don't know, Mariel, do you want to add anything to that? I think the question was also more about uh, taxonomic authorities and taxonomic systems and different, uh, you know, wh how much flexibility is there within Arctos, and there is uh, quite a bit because uh, different collections can choose different uh, taxonomic systems. It's not there's not a single shared system. There is a single Arctos systems, but but if you choose not to use that, you have the option of using others such as NCBI or um, marine invertebrates or other different taxonomic schema. Yeah. So um, yeah. So that's a good point. So yeah, for taxonomy. So the way that we've so there is one sort of taxon tax. Um, taxonomy table in Arctos, but the way it's built is actually by bringing in different um, taxonomic classifications. And so let me see, I'm just randomly choosing one. Um, oops. So here's a subspecies of spotted toes. And you can see that there's different taxonomic. So there's the Arctos sort of classification, which is basically what was in Arctos. Um, but there's also, we pulled in from GBIF, we pulled in from ITIS. Um, in this particular case, it looks like we haven't pulled in from global names, so we've tr we're trying to bring in data from the global names authority. So one of the things about Arctos is that we do try to work with, with partners or other people that are doing these sorts of things as much as possible. So we can pull in the global names and whatever classifications they have will then come into Arctos or as Mariel said, you can create your own classification. Um, so like the mammal collection here, you know, wanted to have the MVZ mammal classification and so you can create your own customized classification if you want or you can use existing classifications and choose which one you want to choose, which one you want to use. Um, Corey, Mike, and Remy wanted to know if there isn't really a standard classification, like um, for fossils, or I might add for ethnohistory or, or cultural objects. Yeah, we do have cultural objects in Arctos, um, University of Alaska. 
Um, the cultural collection is in here, and um, is Kindle on the call? I thought I saw her. Um, I'm not exactly sure how those names were added. Um, I know for, I mean, and we also have a number of different paleontological collections, so again, you know, those were brought in. I know that um, Dusty, who's, you know, the lead programmer, has spent a lot of time talking with those folks about taxonomy, and, you know, I'm not sure if they've created their own classification or not, um, based on the so names that they had. What we Maybe, did for uh, our, or Mariel, do you have something to add? Well, my understanding is there's different. There's two different ways of naming things in Arctos. One is to provide a taxonomic name embedded within a classification, and the other is to provide provide a a, a name that is not embedded within a classification system and that is still searchable. And sometimes those overlap. For example, if you have something like a willow basket, it might be searchable as a basket as the the, the name, but also as willow as salix under that. So there's there's ways of overlapping both systems. So, yeah, that's a good question. Um, one thing on taxonomy that I should mention, I'm sorry, Eric, I interrupted you, but is that we've split up, and I don't know, maybe this is partly what you were saying, Mariel, but split up taxonomy from identification. Is that what you were getting at? Yes. Yeah, so the taxonomy is sort of, the taxonomy is, is um, we try to make it as sort of the formal classification, whereas, um, Whereas identification, right, are names that are applied to objects in the database. Um, so that so that allows you there's flexibility there. So you can have things like hybrids, for example, or question marks, or um, you know new species where you haven't actually named it yet, but you have some sort of nickname that you use for it. Things like that. You can actually add those names to objects through identification. Um, I'm curious, though, yeah, um, I'm going to, so, Mar Erica, did you have something that you wanted to add about this? No, Mariel, and you are covering exactly what I was going to bring up. I do want to say it's 3 o'clock my time, um, so our, our hour is technically over. I think Carla and Mariel are, I'm going to speak for them, happy to hang around for a little bit longer. Um, but if anyone needs to go, please do us a favor and, and uh, take one minute to do the post-webinar survey that's linked above in the chat. And thank you, Gal, for attending. Yes, nice thank you, help. everybody. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, hopefully this was a useful overview. And um, definitely stay tuned for more in-depth discussions of, of these different topics. Can I stop sharing my screen so I can get back on and see? You can if you want. I'll also say that these webinars are going to be recorded, so if you have to leave early or you can't make one of the future ones, you'll be able to see them um, after the fact on the Arctis website. So if we do have another minute, Marielle and Carla, um, Diana has a question about, is there a way to link data entered into Arctos to an automatic export into VertNet or GBIF? Um, and you addressed that earlier in the webinar, but we could touch on that again. Yeah, there's, so basically the way that, that um, the way it works is that um, the data are entered into Arctos and there's, and then uh, the resource needs to be created on the VertNet IPT. So again, remember, it's not just about the data, it's also about the metadata. So there's a process for creating the resource on the, on the VertNet IPT that has all of the metadata associated with it. And then for Arctos, um, the VertNet IPT has a direct database connection to Arctos. So um, you don't need to upload a file or anything. It, it just talks directly to the, to, the, to the database, which is nice because we can schedule it so that it, there's, it automatically updates. And, and it's, it's actually scheduled right now so that each collection or each resource on the VertNet IPT gets updated monthly on a monthly schedule, um, which is great because a lot of the other, the other um, resources it, you know that are that are doing it through things like sharing a file in Dropbox. You need to actually manually share that file. This way, the resource. So Arctos is being updated every day as people enter new data. The VertNet IPT 
for that resource is being updated monthly. And then um, and then there's and then you know GBIF will harvest from that. So there's no way of like you know so it's got to go through the Vertnet IPT. It can't go directly to GBIF um, or to IDIG Bio. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how. I assume that there's some automated thing between GBIF and the Vertnet IPT, but I'm not exactly sure how GBIF gets updated or IDIG Bio gets updated from. From Vertnet, but the Vertnet, because in addition to updating the resource, then it has to be, you know, indexed and all of that. So that's kind of a whole nother process um, for it to actually show up on the portal. But the way that Arctos is set up, it takes this responsibility out of our hands as collection managers. Arctos will automatically make sure your data is available to be harvested by the data aggregators. Right. So we will, yeah, so we, we, um, create the the resource. So we create the the resource, and then um, that gets uploaded to the Vertnet. So we being um, uh, people on the Arctos working group, essentially. I mean, somebody manually has to do it, but not the collect, not the collection, you know, itself. Um, so that's part of what the Arctos working group does, and then um, and then it gets um, uploaded and. Um, published on the Vertnet IPT by somebody on the Vertnet side of things. So, and then once it's there, then there's an automated um, update, a monthly update. So, yeah, so that's one. So the people at the collection don't need to worry about that. They don't need to worry about things like backups of their data. All of the data at TAC are backed up daily. Um, they don't need to worry about security, like, you know, people trying to hack into data. Um, because that's being monitored at TAC. Um, so all of those things that, um, you know, you would have to worry about if you had data on your local server somewhere um, is kind of um, being taken care of. Carla, Andy had a question earlier that actually I have a question. I have the same question. So he asked um, if you can download a, a Darwin Core version of data that you have on Arctos. And I know that it's a Darwin Core archive that gets put on the Vertnet IPT, IPT, and that you could download that from there. But is there is there any way to export part of your data as a in a Darwin Core format, just on an as needed basis? Like say, you know, download search results as a Darwin Core format. Um, there isn't, um, but that may be something that we could discuss with Dusty. Right now, no, there's no way to do that. But that would probably be a, a useful thing to do, and I have no idea what that would take to implement. Um, but that's worth bringing up, you know, with Dusty at maybe one of the, the working group meetings. But right now, yeah, right now the only way to do that is through the Darwin Core archive from the IPT. Of course, the data are downloadable. They're just not in that format. Yes. Right. And Carol's noting that maybe you could go through Curator and convert something you downloaded from Arctos into Darwin Core compliant. Yeah. Are there any other questions from participants at this time? So Carol and Seema raised it. Oh, yeah. To them. Carol and Seema, they had their hand raised. OK, well, thank you all again for coming. I'm going to put the link for the post-webinar survey in the chat again. Please go take that. It's really quick, and it means that you don't have to register for these webinars. And. We will look forward to seeing any of you that would like to attend on October 10th to learn more about searching in Arctos.